Act Two of Henry the Sixth, Part Three, begins with the surviving sons of York getting news about their father's death and his humiliation. But that's not all the news that they get. Uh, Warwick rides up to them after having fought and lost the Second Battle of St. Albans. He had apparently ridden out from London uh, to intercept Margaret's forces before she could reach Parliament and annul the Act of Accord uh, that had made York the heir, uh, that act that York and Henry had agreed to five years previously. Uh, Warwick makes a mistake, though. Uh, He brings King Henry along. Keep in mind uh, that at the time, Margaret is technically a rebel to the crown. Uh, She's breaking the king's peace. So perhaps uh, Warwick thought that by having the king march with him, uh, the soldiers would feel more sure that their cause was right, uh, that uh, their cause was just, and that it would make them more at ease with fighting their own countrymen. Maybe it would make them think it was more like the Jack Cade situation, where this is just another rebellion that needs to be put down. But Henry is so unwarlike, uh, so cold in spirit, Uh, that his presence actually has the opposite effect. Uh, He's weeping for the battle, uh, looking wretched on the front lines, uh, and it causes Warwick's men to lose their morale. Uh, When the fighting starts, uh, they're slow to fight and very fast to flee. Uh, Henry himself (laughs) flees over to Margaret's position, uh, and so the battle's lost uh, pretty swiftly. Richard, uh, again, remember, one of York's sons, he chides Warwick a bit for this, uh, almost jestingly, uh, asking how such a brave soldier as Warwick could uh, could retreat. Uh, But Warwick uh, basically makes a vow that it's the last time he'll be doing that, and that he's still committed to plucking the crown off Henry's head. So all of these are really bad tidings. Uh, But Edward and Richard are uplifted by a heavenly sign. Uh, They see what looks like three suns in the sky at once. And they take it to mean uh, that the three suns of York uh, will soon be rising into their glory. And this was probably an optical phenomenon uh, known as a parhelion. Uh, where a sort of halo forms around the sun with two bright points on either side, uh, making it look like there are three suns in the sky instead of just one. Uh, You can look up pictures of it. It's uh, not unusual to happen. Uh, But because of this, uh, Edward adopts the sun as his heraldic badge, and he says that he'll have it painted on his shield. And Warwick uh, proclaims Edward king at this point, Uh, since Henry has violated his treaty, uh, and they move out to meet the Lancaster forces and their troops. So now both armies are out on the field, and they meet on a plateau between the villages of Towton and Saxton, uh, in the midst of a violent snowstorm, according to the sources, although the play uh, doesn't make mention of that. Uh, But we know a lot about the Battle of Towton, Uh, more so than we do about other battles, and this is from archaeological studies that have been conducted in recent years. Uh, Excavations in the area have uncovered mass graves, uh, and more than 50 uh, complete skeletons uh, have been uncovered from these graves, uh, with extensive post-mortem mutilations inflicted upon them. Uh, meaning uh, that people were tripping over bodies as the fighting continued uh, as they were running away, uh, unabated, uh, for about 10 hours. So this battle begins, uh, and it starts out pretty poorly for the Yorkists. Uh, Clifford and Margaret are raging through the battle, uh, inspiring the troops, uh, and even uh, Margaret's son uh, and Henry's, uh, the young Prince Edward, uh, he's showing something of a martial spirit, and he's playing his part as well. Uh, everyone has basically just told King Henry to stay out of the way, uh, because his presence is actually making things worse. Uh, he wants to be at the battle, uh, but he's more of a hindrance than a help, so his army is mostly being led by the captains, uh, Exeter, Northumberland, uh, and other lords. Uh, So they charge on the Yorkist faction, 
despite uh, an assault from the Yorkist archers. Uh, archers on both sides uh, played a heavy role in the battle's opening phases. Uh, but things pretty soon came down to a close combat, uh, sort of hand-to-hand brawl. Uh, the Yorkists are driven back by the greater numbers of the enemy. And this is probably the point uh, in the play where we see that Warwick kills his own horse uh, as a symbolic gesture, as a sign that he's not going to retreat from battle. And the Sons of York are reinvigorated by this sight, and they run back into the fray as well and rally their men. Uh, Edward, uh, King Edward, uh, from the Yorkist side, he proves to be an exceptional leader here. Uh, He's able to keep his troops organized and inspired uh, until the arrival of the Duke of Norfolk, uh, who came up with reinforcements and turned the tide of the fighting. And we get all of this... All of these details from history, uh, but in the play, Shakespeare instead chooses to focus on King Henry. In the midst of all of this fighting, uh, he's wandering around like a lost child, and finally he just sits down on a small hill and starts lamenting his fate. Uh, he waxes very poetic here, uh, sounding a lot like Richard II, actually. Uh, He wishes that he would rather uh, be a homely swain or a shepherd than a king, uh, because at least they get to live lives of contentment and not have to worry about uh, battle or being betrayed by friends. Now, uh, this sort of introspection is, of course, out of place on the battlefield while people are dying all around him, right? Uh, In fact, uh, Shakespeare, Shakespeare might be alluding here Uh, to his recurring bouts of insanity that we've talked about before. Uh, Apparently, uh, according to contemporary sources, uh, Henry was going through a bad spell at this point, and he was laughing and singing uh, during this battle. But the sad Henry uh, that we see in this play, he's raising some very familiar themes. Uh, He's echoing all of his predecessors, essentially, Uh, who all expressed at one point a longing to be anything other than a king. And then, uh, in the midst of this, he sees two soldiers approaching him. Uh, Acted out, it would probably have been from opposite ends of the stage while he sits in the middle. And each of the soldiers is dragging the corpse of an enemy uh, that they've slain, and each is about to strip off the enemy's armor and see if they have anything worth taking which would happen uh, frequently on a battlefield. But then the younger soldier sees that the enemy that he's killed is his own father. And the older soldier on the other side sees that the one he's killed is his own son. And this is just, you know, it's a heartbreaking scene. Uh, each weeps for what they've done in ignorance, uh, and they, wonders, and they wonder uh, what they're going to tell their family members. Uh, The one, his wife, uh, the other, his mother. And Henry, watching all of this, comes to the realization that it's all his fault. He says, Was ever king so grieved for a subject's woe? Uh, He mentions that it would be better uh, for one of the factions to be utterly defeated uh, than to let the civil war continue, uh, because this is the result. More death. And so he says this, Woe above woe, grief more than common grief. Oh, that my death would stay these ruthful deeds. Oh, pity, pity, gentle heaven, pity. The red rose and the white are on his face, the fatal colors of our striving houses. The one his purple blood right well resembles, the other his pale cheeks methinks presenteth. Whither one rose, let the other flourish. If you contend, a thousand lives must wither. So he's just imploring the heavens, imploring God uh, for all of this to come to an end one way or the other. And I guess we might consider his uh, lamenting a bit selfish here. Uh, He's basically saying that he's got it worse than these two men who have just killed their own family members uh, because he feels the pain of both of them. 
But knowing King Henry uh, as we've come to know him, uh, we I think we can trust that he really does feel their grief deeply. Uh, and he's saying uh, that his grief is worse, not only uh, because he sympathizes with their suffering, but he also feels this added burden of responsibility for it. Uh, he's the cause of their suffering as well. At least that's how he feels. Uh, I mentioned last week that the Battle of Towton holds the distinction of being the largest ever fought on English soil. Uh, contemporary chroniclers put the number of soldiers in the hundreds of thousands, uh, though modern historians say that it was more likely between 50 and 60,000, but huge numbers either way. And uh, Shakespeare's emphasis here on the human drama, uh, the suffering of these two families, uh, anonymous uh, characters in this bloody civil war, really helps, I think, to put a face to those abstract numbers. Uh, we can read about thousands being killed in battle, uh, but it's a whole other thing to hear the mourners uh, weeping over what they've seen and over what they've done. And again, uh, I think it's uh, why it's valuable uh, to study history through the lens of plays and stories such as these. Uh, and what I'm hoping uh, that this class has done for you so far uh, is to give you that experience. So it's not just a, a, a date, uh, a battlefield, and a statistic of casualties. So, uh, with Henry being no help at all, uh, and the Yorkists holding their ground, the Lancaster forces finally uh, break, uh, and they fled across what later came to be known as Bloody Meadow. Uh, both armies had declared that there would be no quarter for prisoners, uh, so as they were fleeing, uh, the Yorkists hunted them down and struck them from behind. Uh, there was a river that had to be crossed to reach safety, and to avoid being sunk uh, by the weight of their armor, uh, the Lancaster troops uh, took off whatever they could uh, to try to swim across. But of course, that just made them even more vulnerable targets uh, for the Yorkists who were coming up behind them. Margaret just barely escapes with Henry. Uh, Clifford is killed in the battle. Uh, Northumberland is killed. Uh, a lot of Henry's most prominent supporters are slain here. Uh, in, in fact, it's estimated that uh, most of the Lancaster forces uh, died who set off to battle, and most of them were killed uh, during the retreat, uh, during the rout instead of during the actual fighting. And we come back once again, uh, to the idea of the uh, ever-turning wheel of fortune. Last week, Margaret was on top. And now, she suffered this devastating loss. Uh, one royal dynasty has supplanted another uh, for the first time uh, since our very first play, uh, Richard II. Uh, the Lancasters are off the throne. Uh, all of their supporters in court uh, are either fleeing or dead. Uh, Margaret, uh, well, she never really had the love of the commoners, uh, but they've sided with uh, the Yorkists now as well. So moving forward, it looks like a complete victory for the Yorkist faction. Uh, Henry is hiding in Scotland. Uh, Margaret and her son are in exile uh, and seeking allies abroad. And Edward has officially claimed the crown, and he's become King Edward IV. It seems like there's not much left to do uh, to shore up his claim and his security. Uh, Warwick decides to go to France and make an alliance for Edward through marriage. And that, another uh, advantageous marriage. Uh, he wants Edward to marry Lady Bona, uh, who is the sister of the current French king, Louis XI. And we actually, we haven't really checked in on what's going on in France for some time now. Uh, so to put it briefly, uh, Louis XI, uh, the French king we see in the play, is the son of the Dauphin who is leading the French armies back in Henry VI Part One. So not too complicated there. 
So it's politically advantageous for Edward to make an alliance with the French royal family because that way he can use his new allies to hunt down the remainder of the Lancaster faction and uh, stamp, stamp out resistance to his reign. And the French will probably be friendly toward him because he just overthrew the family, the Lancasters, that had caused so much grief for the French, right, uh, with Henry V. So it seems like a good match. But there's one problem. Edward has a lot of qualities uh, that we would look for in a good king, right? He's a great warrior. Uh, He's bold and brave. And apparently he knew how to uh, look kingly. Uh, He took special care to wear splendid clothes and shining armor, uh, which contrasted him uh, with uh, his rather... Uh, frail, sickly, bookish predecessor, right? Uh, King Henry looked weak. Edward uh, was tall and imposing, and he always was leading his men from the front lines. Uh, One weakness uh, that he has, though, is women. Uh, Margaret has actually accused him of it before. Uh, She called him a wanton, Uh, when she was mocking the Duke of York before his execution, back in Act 1. The implication here is that he's promiscuous. And his his brothers seem to know it too. Uh, Richard and George both roll their eyes uh, and start making uh, witty asides when he he starts flirting with this widow, Lady Grey. And this would be uh, Elizabeth Grey, uh, whose husband had been killed during the Second Battle of St. Albans. And she's come to the court of the new king to have her husband's lands returned to her after they had been occupied by the Lancaster forces. But Edward just wants to flirt with her and tease her about whether he would uh, return the land to her or not. She's not really in the mood, it seems. She just wants to be about her business, but he's trying to make a scene of it. And he says that he loves her. Uh, And at first she's offended uh, because she thinks that he means to make her his mistress. Apparently he had already had uh, many mistresses already. Uh, But then he says, no, 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 no. you're You're misunderstanding me. I don't want you to be my mistress. I want you to be my wife. Just say that you love me. And this might be, I think, a uh, spur-of-the-moment idea on Edward's part. He hasn't forgotten that he's already promised his hand to Lady Bona of France. Uh, Maybe he really did just want Lady Grey to be his mistress, uh, but he's so consumed with his passion for her that once she seems to reject that proposal, he gets desperate. And he won't let it drop, and he immediately promises uh, that he'll marry her. uh, Anything uh, to get her to love him. So uh, he completely forgets here about the position that he's putting Warwick in, uh, who's already in France at the time, to make the suit to Lady Bona on his behalf. He completely forgets about how badly he needs an ally, like the French king at this point, in order for his rule to be secured. All of that goes out the window uh, because he sees a pretty girl. And the Lady Grey, uh, by all accounts, uh, was a beautiful woman. He makes the same mistake that Henry did by marrying Margaret uh, a few plays ago after he had already pledged himself to another. Only this time, uh, the ramifications are more immediate. Uh, Some of Edward's closest allies and advisors uh, turn against him here, uh, including George, his own brother. Not only do they feel that he's he's, uh, behaved shamefully, uh, they also see that he's made a tactical error here, and they don't want to be on the losing team. So uh, Edward falls out of favor pretty quickly with his own supporters. Uh, They can see how things are going to go now. Uh, now that Edward has uh, made uh, basically a worthless match uh, in place of an advantageous one that had been handed to him on a silver platter. Uh, Who knows, maybe they have King Henry's mistake in mind as well, and they think that the new king is going to go down the same road. 
whatever the reasons are, uh, George, uh, Somerset, uh, and a couple of other lords all just abandon him. Uh, and we'll read more about that in next week's readings. But perhaps the greatest damage uh, that Edward's decision inflicts is that it causes him to lose the support of Warwick. Again, uh, Warwick has been playing the uh, charming salesman to King Louis. He's been talking up how honorable King Edward is and how much he loves Lady Bona uh, from just hearing reports about her beauty. And then, right as he's making these claims, the word reaches the French court that Edward has married a widow of England instead. Now this is obviously an insult to Louis, uh, to Lady Bona, but also to Warwick. He's vouched for this new king's honor. Uh, he's put his own honor on the line. And this comes as a real, uh, frankly, a spit in the face uh, to him. And to make matters worse, Margaret and her son are at the French court at the same time, uh, trying to persuade Louis to lend aid to Henry's cause instead. And after news of this unexpected marriage, uh, it doesn't take Louis long to make up his mind. So, what do you do if you're in Warwick's situation? Uh, you suddenly find yourself surrounded on all sides uh, by enemies, through no fault of your own, uh, and you also look like a complete fool as well. So we can hardly blame him for what he does next, uh, which is to renounce Edward, uh, swear his allegiance to Henry again, and immediately make amends with Margaret. Uh, he even offers his daughter's hand in marriage to her son, Prince Edward, uh, and she agrees. Uh, she says that his words have turned her hate into love. And she starts calling him virtuous and praising the reports that she's heard of his daughter as well. It's almost as if they haven't been fighting bloody conflicts with each other for the past couple of years. And we might question why Margaret would trust such a sudden change of heart in Warwick. Perhaps his anger at Edward's betrayal was really evident uh, and she took him at his ward. Uh, perhaps, or perhaps she didn't trust him. Uh, maybe she was thinking more practically, and she knows that Warwick's family is rich and powerful, and so even if he can't entirely be trusted, uh, she can't pass up this opportunity to make use of his forces while she has the chance. Uh, in either case, uh, everyone in the French court uh, shakes hands and agrees that Edward needs to be removed from the throne and Henry needs to be reinstated. Uh, Louis pledges his support uh, for his sister's sake uh, because she's also felt the insult kingly. So now the French are getting dragged back into this. Uh, so now instead of allies, a whole host of enemies are returning to Edward uh, from across the English Channel. And he has one more problem uh, that he doesn't even know about. And that's his brother, Richard. Now, so far, Richard has proved a valuable ally uh, and a valiant warrior on the battlefield. But now, after seeing Edward's moment of triumph and glory, uh, jealousy and envy are starting to creep into Richard's heart as well. And he speaks to the audience uh, in soliloquy, and he talks about how his uh, physical deformities have made him unfit for any position in society other than ruling and commanding. And these are all things that he'll bring up again in his even more famous soliloquy at the start of the next play, Richard III. Uh, but here, uh, at the end of Act Three, uh, he talks about how he can dissemble, smile at what makes him sad, uh, hide his hatred in his heart, and fool everyone into thinking he's somebody that he's not. He says... Then, since this earth affords no joy to me but to command, to check, to overbear such as are of better person than myself, I'll make my heaven to dream upon the crown, and, whilst I live, to account this world but hell, until my misshapen trunk that bears this head be round and paled with a glorious crown. And yet I know not how to get the crown, for many lives stand between me and home, and I 
like one lost in a thorny wood, that rends the thorns and is rent with the thorns, seeking a way and straying from the way, not knowing how to find the open air, but toiling desperately to find it out, torment myself to catch the English crown. And from that torment I will free myself, or hew my way out with a bloody axe. Why, I can smile, and murder whilst I smile, and cry content to that which grieves my heart, and wet my cheeks with artificial tears, and frame my face to all occasions. I'll drown more sailors than the mermaid shall, I'll slay more gazers than the basilisk, I'll play the orator as well as Nestor, deceive more slyly than Ulysses could, and like a Sinon take another Troy. I can add colors to the chameleon, change shapes with Proteus for advantages, and set the murderous Machiavel to school. Can I do this and cannot get a crown? Tut, were it farther off, I'll pluck it down. So here we see the emergence into the drama of another overreacher, uh, much like his father had been. But he seems to believe that he has some special cunning uh, that his father didn't possess, uh, which is going to protect him from coming to the same bad end. So even though George is the one that outwardly left Edward's side, once Edward made his foolish mistake, uh, Richard, who's still clinging to him, is the one he really needs to watch out for. Uh, for next week, we'll finish up Henry VI Part 3. Uh, so read both Acts 4 and 5. Thanks for watching.